Alright, so this video is going to be about Isaiah 13. It's going to be a verse-by-verse -verse chapter study. Um, I'm going to include a bunch of other stuff. There's going to be stuff that I don't expound on um, because I have other videos th that need to be redone uh, due to poor audio quality, but I, um, I've already expounded on it and don't really have the time to go back and remake all of those at this point. So <clears throat> I'll start by reading. It says, The Burden of Babylon which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them. Shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the hosts of the battle. They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord, and the weapons of his indignation, to destroy the whole land. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed, one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place, in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. And it shall be as the chaste roe, and as the sheep that no man taketh up, they shall every man turn to his own people, and flee every one into his own land. Every one that is found shall be thrust through, and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes, their houses shall be spoiled, and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold they shall not delight in it. Their bows also shall dash the young women to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb, for the, um, <clears throat> their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. And the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. Alright, so a few things. Um, there's a lot here. This bottom portion is talking about Mystery Babylon, and I'll prove that once we get back down there. Um... Yeah, there's so much, uh, there's so many key doctrines that are misunderstood by a lot of people that are encapsulated in this chapter. Uh, so let's just start by reading it over again. It says, The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. That's the prophet, that's the minor prophet Amos. It says, Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones, that's the saints. I have, I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, even them that rejoice in my highness. So this is talking about Jesus bringing the saints of the Most High. He's bringing saved believers with him in the clouds. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. So this is found everywhere uh, throughout the prophets. But what this is saying is basically in verse 3 we have the armies of God versus the armies of Satan, the army of Antichrist. And it's a face-off here. Um, and it's God who's putting it in their hearts to come against him. It says, They come from a far country, from the end of heaven, even the Lord, and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. That's the, the entire land. He's going to destroy all of it. And I'll get... Uh, 
into more detail about what land he's talking about. It says, Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. So there's no question about the timeline and the setting that we're talking about here. The fact is, is that Babylon has not been destroyed yet. Babylon still exists today. It's not heavily populated, but there, like Saddam Hussein had a summer home there. Um, there, they've restored it. The the Ishtar Gate is still there that Nebuchadnezzar put up. Um, for the most part, <clears throat> Babylon is still around, even though it's nothing compared to what it was. Um, but the context here is the day of the Lord. So either Babylon is going to be brought back, or this is talking about mystery Babylon, and I believe that it's talking about mystery Babylon. Um, and I'll prove that. It says, Howl ye for the destruction, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. Now this sounds like what Jesus said. Men's hearts failing them for fear of what is coming on the earth. The, the Olivet Discourse, when he, this is no, there's no doubt. He, this is the same thing as Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. It says, and they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows. So they're going to have cramps, pains in their body. Like, they're going to be so overly emotional. Like, they're just going to be going nuts. Pains and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. Now, when I first read this, um, kind of made me think of like the saints looking at each other, but this is talking about unbelievers. When you think about that day, the Bible says in Peter uh, that the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So this could be as a result of the heat. It could be a result of the brightness of Christ's coming. Um, most likely one of those two things or something like that. Uh, it says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger. So right there we have uh, the day of the Lord comes with what? What is What comes with it? Well, wrath. So right there, the day of the Lord is prior to God's wrath because it's coming with him. With wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate. So he's doing both of those things at the same time. He's pouring his wrath out upon the nations and he's going into the outlying Islamic nations surrounding Jerusalem to destroy them. Uh, he's going. He's going to go into Arabia. He's going to go into northern Arabia, southern Jordan, Tyre, Palestine, and Gaza, according to Joel three. Tyre, which is in Lebanon, which is Ezekiel twenty-eight verses twenty through twenty-six. We've got Isaiah nineteen talking about the Lord cometh. Uh, riding upon a swift cloud and shall enter into Egypt. That's a modern-day Islamic nation. Edom. Edom is northern Arabia and southern Jordan. We've got Isaiah 21 telling us plainly that it's going to be in Arabia. All of Isaiah 21 is talking about the destruction of Babylon, but every single nation mentioned in Isaiah 21, Duma, Seir, those are all in Edom. That's Arabia. Babylon is Edom. And you could go back and watch my Identity of Mystery Babylon video, and that'll prove it to you as well, even though... I do have to update that video because of the audio issues. I didn't have a microphone at the time that I made that video. Uh, Kush. Kush is going to be another one. Kush. C-U-S-H in the Bible. Northern Sudan and southern Egypt. Again, an Islamic nation. Libya. Ezekiel 35. Uh, not 35, but 30 verse 5. Uh, Moab. That's Jordan. Jo Moab and Ammon. Th that's Jordan. We've got that in Zephaniah 2. We've got that in Numbers 24, 17, Jeremiah 25, 15 through 30, Jeremiah 49, 1 through 6. We've got Turkey, which is, Turkey is Magog. Turkey is Magog, Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, Togarma. Ezekiel 32, uh, verses 26 to 28, and then Ezekiel 39, 6. Uh, look up a map. Look, Gog, Magog, Turkey map. Look at that. You'll see a bunch of maps. It's Turkey. Gog and Magog is in Turkey. Yavan. Yavan is also Turkey. Uh, Syria, the burden of Damascus, uh, Isaiah 7, verse 8. Uh, Persia, Daniel 2, 34 through 35. Uh, Iran, Revelation 13, 2, uh, with the, the bear. Uh, Nineveh, Assyria, going to be destroyed. Ze uh, Zechariah 10, 5 through 12. Zephaniah 2, 1 through 13. Micah 5, 6. Iraq, Babylon, Isaiah 13 through 14. Jeremiah 50, 51. I mean... There's no doubt about it that he's going into those Islamic nations. Um, where was I here? 
So it says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. And look at this. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Man, if you've read the if you've read Matthew twenty four a few times, you like that verse right here in Isaiah thirteen sticks out to you. Why? Because Matthew twenty four says, um, uh, hold on a second. Matthew 24 it says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And notice, her light, it's a possessive. It's not the sun's light bouncing off of it. It's a possessive statement that Jesus is making. You can say, well, he was just talking allegorically, but if you didn't have the poison of conventional science, you wouldn't believe that. You would believe, oh, the moon has its own light. It's its own light source, based on what Jesus said. Uh, just another uh, attack by the devil to remove the power of God's word. And the stars shall fall from heaven. There you go again. Tell me how, as a Bible-believing Christian, a truly Bible-believing Christian, you can believe what Jesus is saying in verse Ma or Matthew 24, 29, and still believe uh, in the conventional science model of the heliocentric uh, space model of the sun and the earth and everything and moving and all that. It doesn't make sense. I don't want to go off on that. I don't want to sound like some crazy flat earther or whatever. I just want the scripture to make sense. And if the stars are falling from heaven, and conventional science is correct in terms of the size of these stars, then there's no way that the amount of energy released that any any sort of life could survive that. I'm sorry. If you're going to tell me that Jupiter is going to fall into Earth, and that uh, Orion and all these other constellations and these stars are just going to fall from heaven onto the Earth as a fig casteth her untimely figs, and the earth is going to remain, there's no way that Jesus is right and conventional science is right. I believe that those lights, that those uh, stars, are nowhere near as big as what they tell us. No, not even close. And the best the best thing you can find in terms of a, a, a scope, all you'll find is, lick, is a flickering light. Some of those stars are translucent, but again, I'm not going on that. Uh, it says, And the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. So tell me, what comes first? The tribulation. Immediately after the tribulation, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and then shall the Son of Man come in, uh, and then shall they see, and then shall see, and and I'm sorry, wow. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. There's the rapture right there. So we have the tribulation, we've got Christ coming in the clouds, and then we've got the rapture. Uh, he spells it right out for you, and he says immediately after, and then... So he's telling us in chronological order. Well, Matthew is just to the Jews. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Because Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 are the exact same sermon. The exact same sermon. It wasn't two different times. Oh, Matthew 24 was preached then and Mark 13. No, it's just two different angles on the same moment of time where Jesus was preaching. And Mark 13... Um, says, where are we here? I lost it. It says, but in those days, after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. The sun being darkened, and the moon not giving her light, is the day of the Lord. And the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. And then we see everything, just like Matthew 24, 29-31. It's just lined right up. And notice, in the end of Mark 13, he doesn't say what I'm saying unto you, I'm just saying to you, Jews. No, he says, take heed, watch, and pray, for you know not when the time is. He says, uh, watch you therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. So to say that Matthew 24 is only written to the Jews is just heresy. I don't care what you say, it's heresy. It's false. It's false doctrine. It's a corruption of God's word, and it's confusing people about end times, and it's going to cause a lot of people to die. 
it's nonsense and people need to stop being stupid and stop believing what seminaries and Bible colleges, those unbiblical satanic institutions have to say. Because there's nothing else that peddles more heresy than a, a mainstream institution for Christianity, which has never been stated in the Bible once. You find it nowhere in the Bible, but you find it in secular America. Why? Because Satan has more power than people think. And if they're not reading their Bible, then they're more susceptible to deception. Uh, whoops, I accidentally canceled out Isaiah 13. Didn't mean to do that. It says... Okay, so we have the sun being darkened and is going forth. The moon shall not cause her light, and I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. There is the glorification of our bodies. That's what I believe that is. If God's making a man more precious than fine gold, it's because our appearance and our value is far beyond that. It's because he's already he's glorified our bodies, and we've been well glorified and justified in the flesh and not just the spirit it says therefore I will shake the heavens and the earth shall remove out of her place yet again if the heliocentric model of conventional science is correct then God is not correct you can't have it both ways and the earth shall remove out of her place the Bible says all the time that God hath founded the earth on he hath laid it on a foundation and the pillars that it be not moved. And now God is saying that the earth shall remove out of her place. If the earth has a place, that, that means that it's not moving through space-time. That means it has a location to which it is affixed and is not moving from that location. Again, you either believe the Bible or you believe... I'm not asking you to believe like flat earth, blah, blah, blah. I'm asking you to believe the Bible. What does the Bible say? I'm not talking flat, circle, pair, square. I'm saying the earth doesn't move, at least from its own place. It may spin in a certain place, according to this verse. doesn't matter. I don't believe that, but... And the earth shall remove out of her place. The earth has its own place. And the moon has its own light. Again, I don't want that to be the focal point or something that uh, is only drawn from this video. It says, in the, in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger, and it shall be as the chaste roe. I believe that's a rabbit. Uh, the heart is the deer. I'm not sure. Uh, but if I had to guess, I would say that that's a rabbit. And as a sheep that no man taketh up, they shall every man turn to his own people and flee every one into his own land. So these people are running scared. They're petrified. Uh, every one that is found shall be thrust through, and every one that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Now, so it's talking about the day of the Lord. Um, it's talking about, uh, where is it? it says, the day of the Lord cometh. So it's not actually there yet. It hasn't happened yet, but he's saying it's about to happen, and this is what's going to happen when it happens. And then it goes down here, and it talks about the destruction of Babylon, because the destruction of Mystery Babylon is something that Antichrist and the Median uh, kings are going to do to Arabia. Uh, right here, I will stir up the Medes against them. Um, and the Medes are going to come against uh, Babylon, and they're going to destroy them. This was not fulfilled in the time of uh, Babylon's destruction, because, uh, again, I covered this in other videos, Medea did not destroy Babylon like that. They snuck in after diverting water from a moat that was coming from the Euphrates River, they snuck in, they killed Belshazzar, and they took the city. They didn't destroy all the people in the streets and stuff. That's not how it happened. Um, it says, Their bows also shall dash the young men to pieces, and they shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon... So he's going back to that. He was talking about the day of the Lord, now he's talking back about Babylon. He's talking about the destruction of Babylon from verse 1 downward... But he says, well, the day of the Lord's coming. So kind of, he's kind of like, look, things are bad on earth. Like Antichrist is destroying things. He's conquering things and he's setting up power. And after Babylon, mystery Babylon's destroyed, Antichrist actually sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem. So I believe that this chapter is more like a, these things are happening. God knows they were going to happen thousands of years ago. The day of the Lord's coming. Trust me, God, the Savior's coming. Like he's going to come and he's going to protect and all that stuff. 
It says, In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. Okay, now, there's no doubt that this is talking about Mystery Babylon. When the Medes against them shall not regard silver and as for gold, they, all this stuff, uh, killing children and young men in the streets, that did not happen. Medea has never done that to Babylon. A look in any historical account of Medea uh, and Persia, Medo Persia, conquering Babylon, and you will never find this stated as happening. It has not happened. But obviously, God is true. This has not happened yet. And I will prove uh, by correlating these two verses with verses in Jeremiah that, in fact, this is talking about Edom, mystery Babylon. Um, and then it talks about, but wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. Um, so, yes, let's go to, where do we have it here? Did I save it? Oh, here it is. Okay. So we have Jeremiah 49. As in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, no man shall abide there, neither shall a son of man dwell in it. That's Jeremiah 49. Now, Jeremiah 49 is talking about Edom. See? Edom. Jeremiah 49 starts out by saying, The burden uh, against Edom. Jeremiah 50 and 51 are about Babylon. But look at this. This is Isaiah 13, 19, talking about Babylon. It says, In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, get that out of here. So it's the exact same statement as over here, but this is talking about Edom, and this is talking about Babylon. That's weird. And we have down here, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Why would the Arabian pitch their tent in New York City? Why would the Arabian pitch their tent in Babylon? They wouldn't. Why would they cross that? Why would they go between those two rivers and just like be there and pitch their tent there? It doesn't make sense. Unless in the future, like Babylon is reinvented into some like major hub, but that still wouldn't make sense because Revelation 17 says that it's a major trade hub by sea. There is no major trade hub by Babylon. It's got rivers next to it, but it's not a sea, and God knows the difference between certain bodies of water. He talks about the seas, he talks about the rivers, and he talks about the fountains and the waterfall. He talks about all different types of bodies of water. He knows the difference between a river and a sea. Ancient Babylon is not mystery Babylon. It wouldn't be a mystery. Um, Jeremiah 49, verse 19. I don't even want to read that because it's so big. But uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah 13, verse 19. Hold on a second. Yeah, it says, Behold, he cometh from Jordan, from the swelling of Jordan, now this is this is perfectly mirrored in uh, Jeremiah 50, so I guess I shouldn't be going over that because this is about Isaiah 13. Um, Jeremiah 50, verse 39 says, "Therefore the wild beasts of the desert, with the wild beasts of the island, shall dwell there, and the owls shall dwell therein, and it shall no more be inhabited forever. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation." Also notice this: Jeremiah 50 is about Babylon. Jeremiah 49 is about Edom. And Isaiah 13 is about Mystery Babylon, and Jeremiah 50 is saying the exact same thing. It says, As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. That is the exact same statement as Isaiah 13, 19, and Jeremiah 49, 18. It's, it's literally the exact same statement. There's a few different wordings, but he's saying the same thing. Jeremiah 50, verse 39. This is the exact same thing as Isaiah 13:20. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. Tell me that's not the same thing as this. Owls shall dwell therein, and it shall not be inhabited. Like, it's just the same thing. Isaiah 13:17. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them. 
Well, let's go to Jeremiah 51, which is clearly, there's nobody that would argue that Jeremiah 51 is about mystery Babylon and not ancient Babylon. But yet it's talking about Edom, Babylon, and mystery Babylon because all three are one and the same in terms of these passages. It uh, says, yeah, God has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes against Babylon. It's just the same it's the same thing. Jeremiah 51 verse 37 says, And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, in astonishment and in hissing without inhabitant. Isaiah 13 22 says, And the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses, and drags, dragons in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. Basically the same statement. Um, so I think that that's, that's interesting to note. Um, yeah, and just to expound a little bit more on the uh, the rapture timing, where is it? Right here. Uh, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof. Well, let's go. It says, "Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it." For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Hold on, I think I missed something here. Okay, we don't need that. So, what is this? Joel chapter 2, down in verse 10, it says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. This is God, Jesus Christ, leading the saints in our in the war at this at the exact same time as right here. Where the day of the Lord's coming, Christ is coming on the clouds, he's coming with his wrath, which he's about to pour out. He's gonna pour out his wrath while he physically is conquering, he's gonna lay the whole land desolate, and he's gonna destroy the sinners at the same time that the sun is darkened and the moon is darkened. And the stars are going to withdraw their shining and not give their light. It's the exact same statement. Joel 2.10 and Isaiah 13.10 is the, is the exact same thing. They're both talking about the day of the Lord and what happens at the day of the Lord. And up here in Joel, it says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. What does it say here? Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Look at this. It's the same thing. It's the same statement. Amos 5.20 says, Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Yet again. Um... I wanted to include this in here as a small little tidbit. Uh, Amos 5.27. This really has nothing to do with what we're talking about. but It says, Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Now, look at this. But ye have borne the tabernacle of Moloch, and she in your images, the star of your God. That's the star of David, which ye have made yourselves. Therefore, because you have done this, I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus. That is not the Babylonian exile, people. I don't know why people think that's the Babylonian exile. They need to look at a map whose name is the God of hosts. Now, they're going to go into captivity beyond Damascus. Well, let's take a look at where Damascus is. Damascus is one of the most ancient cities on earth. Oh. Ancient Damascus map. Now, let's look at where Damascus is in relation to... Um, Babylon and all these other places. So you have Jerusalem and Judah down here. You've got the southern kingdom of Judah right here. And then you've got Damascus up here. But then Babylon's over here to the to the far east. Not far east, but to the east. So w what's the issue here? Well, if it's saying that I will, I will lead you, therefore I will cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, you can't really say, oh, well, we're going to cross this river, go through Ammon, and all the way to Babylon, and that's past Damascus, even though Damascus is like hundreds of miles to the north. No, they're going to go beyond Damascus into the north countries, into Syria, into Lebanon, into Turkey. That's where they're going. They're going to go down into captivity into Egypt, into Arabia, over into Persia. When Antichrist comes into that land and sells them off, that's what Joel 3 says. 
People need to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. But again, Amos 5, it cannot be talking about the Babylonian exile. Damascus has always been there. Jerusalem has always been there. Babylon has always been there. So that doesn't make sense. It just does not make sense. Joel 3 says, Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Now anybody who really has an admiration and adoration for the book of Revelation will know instantly that even if they don't know that it's in chapter 14 of Revelation, they'll know, yeah, that's that's Revelation. That's the rapture. Yes, it absolutely is the rapture. And uh, we'll finish this. It says, Multitudes, multitudes, in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. So, yet again, the day of the Lord is coupled with the sun and moon being darkened, and the stars not shining their light. The Lord also... In conjunction with what I just said, Joel saying, the Lord also shall roar out of Zion. So physically, Jesus is going to be on the Mount of Olives, the book of Zechariah says, and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So he's going to help those physical remnants after they've already been punished, because he's going to punish them. He's going to send them into captivity. He's going to ruin them. And some of them are going to side with Antichrist, but he's going to keep a remnant, and that's what he's talking about. That is not us as Christians. That is the children of Israel. That wicked Christ-rejecting nation, has, just because they reject Christ doesn't mean that Christ rejects them. It, I mean, if they die, they go to hell, obviously, without Christ. But in terms of who they are, God is faithful. But it says, but the Lord will be the hope of his people. There's the Christians. And notice how it says that first. And there's other places where it says, that I, I will save the tents of Judah first, that the children of Israel do not boast against them. He's, that's why he's going to save us, and he's going to sanctify and rapture the Christians first before he uses us and commands us in his army, in God's army, to conquer the Islamic nation so that he can bring his people out of the north parts and back into that land. Now, it's us that's going to live in that land, but he will have a, a portion of land for them. And as long as they remain sinless, they will be able to stay in that land. And yes, they will be able to fight sin more because the devil will be bound in the pit for a thousand years. Way Going way too deep here, um, but it is, it is what it is. And this is the beginning of the thousand year reign. So up here where it says, put you in the sickle... So we have the sun and so we got the rapture, the sun and moon being darkened. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun and moon be darkened. So the tribulation has already happened. God is what is what does this verse say? Uh oh, I got out of it. Joel two. He comes he's coming with wrath. The day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger. So he's bringing his wrath. He's uh gonna rapture his people, and he's gonna con he's gonna fight these nations that come against him in the valley of Jehoshaphat after he's gone into all these other nations and trashed them. How stupid do these nations have to be to think that they can go against God? What fools? Uh, but put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. So Christ is coming. Let the heathen be waked and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle. Revelation says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap. So he was he was sitting on a cloud. Jesus is sitting on a cloud. And what does this say right here? Well, where is it? Uh, For there will I sit. He's not talking about just remaining in a certain... He's sitting. He's sitting down on a cloud. He's just sitting on a cloud. Like a boss. Because he is the boss. He's the boss of bosses. He's the king of kings. And right here it says that he's sitting on a cloud. Uh, and this angel is telling him to thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then it says, uh, and the earth was reaped. And then it says down here, uh, for her grapes are fully ripe. Talking about how their wickedness is completely full. Same thing that it says right here. For the press is full, the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. And then it talks about down here. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in the sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust...
his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So, their wickedness is great. He's calling them, like, fats. Uh, their fats, uh, the press is full, uh, the wine press, it's the same, it's the same statement. He's talking about the same thing. This is Joel. This is Revelation. This is Isaiah 63. Uh, it says, who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bozrah? Now, why are Jesus's garments dyed? It's blood. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I, so Jesus responds. He says, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. There's no doubt this is Christ. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, this person asks, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat. Why does it look like you've just made a bunch of grape juice or uh, wine or jam or jelly? Why does it look like you've just been stopping a bunch of grapes? Uh, well, he answers and he says, I have trodden the wine press alone. So it's the same wine press mentioned in Joel 3.13, the press that uh, is... Uh, reaped with the sickle, the same sickle mentioned in Revelation 14, when they're cast into the great wine press of the wrath of God, and you've got this 200-mile-long uh, river of blood that's going up to the horse bridles, the horse, the necks of the horse. It's just crazy how angry God is. Uh, I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me. I don't. Now this has always confounded me because I thought that we were going to be with Jesus when he was conquering, but I believe that Jesus is going to go off and do his own thing at some point. He's going to command us to go into certain places and do his bidding there. So he's going to say, "Go there, go there, go there," and he's going to command his army with a shout, and then he's going to go off and he's going to be a solo conqueror king, and he's just going to trash those who he really just wants to destroy them by himself. His anger is so mad that he wants to have the satisfaction of just destroying them by himself. That's what I gather from this. I could be wrong, but he does say that uh, when he comes out of Edom, that there was none with him. That seems a little strange. For I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. So he's going to come in the clouds with this perfectly pure white vesture, uh, which is the righteousness of God. And he's going to have a name written on his thigh, the word of God, the king of kings and the lord of lords, all this stuff. And it says, and I will stain all my raiment, all of it. It's, he's going to be covered in blood of his enemies. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. So look, look at this. The day of vengeance and the year of my redeemed is the same thing. The day of the Lord, where he's going to seek vengeance and pour out his wrath, and he's going to physically conquer these nations, is the same year of the rapture. There's no seven-year difference there. You know what I mean? It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. It's heresy. The pre-tribulation rapture is heresy. It's going to cause a lot of people to die. Uh, Paul, uh, Jonah, um, well, Jonah's, Jonah's a bad example. Um, you've got, what, Joseph. Um, you've got Job. You've got King David running from Saul. You've got all these righteous men in the Bible suffering righteous persecution, yet you think that somehow... You're different. You're out of your mind. You're crazy. I'm sorry. We're going to be here for the tribulation, the great tribulation, and then we're going to be raptured out before God pours his wrath out. Tribulation just means affliction and trouble. Not to be confused with wrath. God's wrath is not the tribulation. The tribulation is actually Satan's wrath because... Uh, what does Revelation 12 says? Um, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, for he know that he hath but a short time. So that's when the tribulation begins, when Satan's cast out of heaven. So we have that being, uh, that we have the tribulation, the great tribulation being the wrath of Satan, and then God is going to pour out his wrath on the devil and his children on earth. I mean, the Bible is absolutely clear. I just don't understand how anyone could think other than that. I just don't. Um, I did want to cover um, the saints, and then I'll tie this video up. I always make really long videos. Um, okay, so we'll start there, and then... Jill 
able to. Okay. In Isaiah uh, chapter 5, starting in verse 24, it says, Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust. Because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts, and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel, therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he has stretched forth his hand against them. God is going to smite the children of Israel, and has smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. He's allowing Antichrist to enter that land and to destroy them, and to sell them into captivity. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Now, what does this mean? Now, could this be him stretching out his hand to harm them? Uh, well, I believe so, because it says, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, but his hand is stretched out still. Now, there are times when God's like, why well, I, I stretched out my hand and no man regarded, where he's like trying to reach out to somebody and give them mercy and love. But that's not what this is talking about right here. And I and he will lift up an ensign to the nations from far and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth. The earth has an end? What? Ye, find me the end to a ball. And behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. <laughs> That's the saints of the Most High. None shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed, nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. Whose arrows are sharp, and all their bows bent. They're ready for war. They're they're riding on horses, just aiming, just ready to smite someone at the command of their god. Their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint, and their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey, and shall carry it away safe, and none shall deliver it. What do I believe that this is talking about? I believe that we as the the saints are going to go in and we are going to save the children of Israel. That is what's going to happen. And I will read that in Joel. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. And in that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow, and the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Joel 2 says, um, so yeah, it's darkened right there. Darkened in the heavens thereof. Blow you the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. As the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them. This is talking about the saints. And behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. As Is as the garden of Eden before them. That seems to be like the kingdom of Antichrist just making this awesome, super worldly, like, gold and beautiful kingdom on earth, and it just looks so great. And, like, you just see, like, this eraser that's Jesus Christ and all of his saints just erasing the land. And before him, you see, oh, that's so beautiful, you beautiful, and then you wipe the eraser over it, and it's just, like, garbage. It's just absolutely trashed. That's great. And behind them, a desolate wilderness, because that's what they're leaving behind. Yay. And nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble, as a strong man set in battle array. So these saints are ready for war. Before their face the people shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They're petrified. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. This is talking about the saints still. And they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city, and shall run upon the wall, and they shall climb up upon the horses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble, 
the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining, and the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word, for the day of the Lord is great and very table, uh, terrible, and who can abide it? Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Uh, and then it talks about a fast. Uh, be, then will, and it says, look, uh, it says, let the priests... The, the ministers of the Lord weep between the per, uh, porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. This is talking about the children of Israel. It's not talking about Christians, and I'm going to prove it. That the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? First of all, this is not going to happen to a Christian. A Christian is not, God is not going to leave them nor forsake them ever. That's a fact. So if God has forsaken these people, it's because they have forsaken the name of God, which is Jesus Christ. It says, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. God is going to, even though those Christians, or those Christians, those Jews do not worship God properly, they're still viewed as the children of the God of Abraham, even though they're not. So when the Muslims conquer them, they're going to talk bad about Jehovah. They're going to mock Jehovah and say, where's your God now? And then God's going to come in the clouds, he's going to gather his saints, and he's going to destroy them. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far from you the northern army. What part of the enemy of... Uh, Israel, the enemy of God at the time of the day of the Lord comes from the north, does not make sense. Daniel 11 says that the Antichrist, the vile person in Daniel 11, uh, 22, I believe, down to, chap down to verse 32, that man is the king of the north. He's the king of Turkey. He's the caliph. And will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land. So yet again, he's talking to the land. Um, be glad then, ye children of Zion. That's the children of Israel. Um, I will restore the years as low and you shall eat in plenty and it shall come to it. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So there we have it again. Um, and what is this? This is Joel 2. Joel 3. Um, well, it says, for, your, for behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. He's going to allow Antichrist to sell these people into these outlying Islamic nations. I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, the same place where Jesus is going to sit on that cloud and will plead with them there for my people and my heritage, Israel. He, This is not Christians. If Jesus is in the clouds sitting atop the valley of Jehoshaphat, we've already been raptured. He's not going to plead for us if we're already glorified and become immortal. Think, think beyond what some pastor says. There are great pastors out there, but they're not infallible. The word of God is the truth. God has not cast off his people. Romans 9, Romans 10, Romans 11, which he did foreknow. He did not do that. I'm sorry, he didn't. 
They don't belong in that land. They don't belong in that land. They don't worship the right God. They don't belong in that land. But that doesn't mean that God loves them any less. I'm sorry. It doesn't. I'm not sorry. It's the word of God. So after the rapture, Jesus is about to go to war with all these armies in the valley of Megiddon, Armageddon. And it says, and he's pleading there with them for my people and my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And down here he says, Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? That's the Gaza Strip, dude. It's the coast. It's on the sea coast. Tyre and Zidon is on the west coast of Lebanon. This is, I mean, what else like, does it have to say? It says, And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for an harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. That's oil. They're selling sex slaves for oil. They're selling, like, the, they're selling the children of Israel to the outlying Islamic nations. And uh, it says, Will ye render me a recompense? Because God's going to come in there and he's going to wreck all these nations and Palestine. And he's going to say to him, he's going to like, are you going to pay me back? Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Basically what he's saying is, you do something to me, I'm going to throw it right back in your face, double. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and have carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. This is not cryptic. It's clear that the gold that is going to be in the new temple is God's gold even though God does not approve of that temple being built or any of the abominations that are going to be done in that temple, it's still God's. It's still God's. It's his. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. That's Turkey. Grecia is Turkey. Greece. Grecia covered parts of Turkey. Uh, Laodicea. Uh, Smyrna. Thyatira. Uh, Philadelphia, all these places are in Asia Minor. Grecia, the Roman province of Asia Minor in western Turkey. Grecia is Turkey. It's not Athens or Sparta. It's Turkey. Behold, I will raise them out of the place whither you have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head and I will sell your sons and your daughters. This is talking about the thousand years. Uh, those people, the remnants, will serve Judah. Um... So yeah, and I went over I went over this, but look at this down here. Um hold on. I think this is in here. No, that's in Zechariah then the tents of Judah. But it doesn't matter because I'm I'm not gonna go to Zechariah right now. Uh, it says, The Lord sh also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth shall shake. But the Lord will be the hope of his people, those are Christians, and the strength of the children of Israel. That's the children of Israel. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy. See, it's not holy right now. It's spiritually Sodom and Egypt right now. Tel Aviv is the biggest Sodomite capital. It's got all these nasty nasty abusers of themselves and mankind, these nasty defilers of the flesh, these nasty, nasty people. And they, they, they think that they're so great. They think, oh yeah, we're so liberated. No, you're in such bondage to Satan. You have no idea. And it shall come to pass in that day. What day? The day of the Lord. It's going to happen in a single day. That's what Ezekiel 38 is talking about. It's not talking about May 14th, 1948. I, Ezekiel 38, shall a nation be brought forth in one day? That wasn't talking about the reestablishment of Israel. That's talking about the reestablishment of Israel by God before the thousand-year reign of Christ. And it shall come to pass in that day, the day of the Lord, that the mountain shall drop down new wine. So he's, gonna, he's doing all of this in 24 hours. He's doing it all in a day. And the hills shall flow with milk. And all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth out of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Chittim. I know this is really random, but uh, I've heard people say um, that milk is something that only babies should drink. I think that's stupid, because there's not going to be any babies uh, that are immortal. The hills of Jerusalem, the holy Jerusalem that we're going to live in, is going to have milk in it. Uh, God said that uh, I will send you into a land uh, flowing with milk and honey. So milk is a good thing. It's uh, like a 
luxury. Milk is good. Anyway, Egypt shall be a desolation, Isaiah 19. And Edom shall be a desolate wilderness, uh, Isaiah 21, Isaiah 63, uh, Jeremiah 49, Jeremiah 50. I mean, I could just riddle off these for the next five minutes. For the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. For, because, why, wait, how is this going to happen? How is verse 20 going to happen? Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. For, because I, says God, will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. So yes, Jesus is going to come in the clouds. And they will look upon him whom they have pierced. They will grieve for him as one grieveth for his only son. And he is going to save them because God loves them. That's the truth. Um, so that's that. Uh, hope this was informative. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, leave a comment. Um, if you haven't already, uh, give me a subscription here. Uh, subscribe to my channel. Um, I'm, I don't put out many videos, uh, but most of the videos I do are full of a lot of meat. Um, my my first few videos that I had on here were not the greatest quality because I didn't have a microphone at that time. But if you uh, would like to give me suggestions for future videos, um, I will uh, take those into account, and I'm going to be redoing some of the past videos. Uh, God bless, and uh, like I said, I hope this video was a blessing to you.